Good morning and welcome to Church Online. My name is Harry and I'm on staff here at St Stephen's. We're so glad that you've joined us for our online service today. We have Rachel Bedford, our Associate Vicar, kicking off a series based in the book of James. And today we'll be thinking about faith that endures. Now, before we come to our opening song of worship, there are a few things to let you know about. We have our APCM tomorrow night, Monday the 25th of April, starting at 7.45 over at church. Come and hear about all the different ministries, kids, youth, social transformation, and so much more that is going on in the life of St Stephen's. Secondly, this year's HTB Leadership Conference is taking place online on the 2nd and 3rd of May, and we'd love to encourage you to get involved with at least one of the sessions. So if interested, please do sign up over at leadershipconference.org.uk. And finally, we're so excited to launch applications for the internship year here at St Stephen's. So please do check out this video. What an amazing opportunity to join us here at St Stephen's. Is there anyone that you can think of that might be interested in that opportunity? We'd love for you to share it with them. Now, as we go into a time of sung worship, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we welcome you now, wherever we are watching from. We thank you for your amazing grace, your unfailing love, and the freedom that we can find in you. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King of love for kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, 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 Lord, this is amazing grace. This is with you to worship today. I'm going to be starting a new series today on the book of James that we're going to be doing for the next six weeks. I'm going to read today from James 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So as I said, we're starting a new series on James and it's all about faith. So how is your faith doing? Are your faith levels high, low or non-existent? Can you remember a time when you had a vibrant multicolour faith, but it's feeling a bit grayscale now? Do you long for faith, but you're not quite sure how to get it? The concept of faith can feel a bit slippery, can't it? We can't see it, we can't box it, we can't reach out and touch it. Yet the biblical understanding of faith is that it's tenacious and powerful. It's solid and definable. We read in the Bible that faith can move mountains. But here's the thing. However you measure your faith, I believe that all of us put our faith in something or someone, be it other people, material resources, scientific beliefs, or simply each day we have faith that the sun will rise and fall. So if we all put our faith somewhere, what is it that makes Christians different? It's that we choose to put our faith in a person, Jesus Christ. A person who we celebrated last week rose from the dead and is alive today and can be known. The book of James reminds us that faith in someone who conquered death, the thing that no one else has done or can do, is powerful and dynamic. It's life transforming and world altering. We live in uncertain times. So how then does or has our faith fared in times of COVID, conflict, confusion, crisis or change? James, writing 2,000 years ago, was writing to people experiencing, perhaps not COVID, but certainly the other things, conflict, confusion, crisis, and chaos. They also had the added challenge of being violently persecuted for their faith. 
his encouragement to the church was that they chase after a faith that endures. And my invitation to you is for the next six weeks to be honest with yourself about your faith, to consider this teaching series as a bit of a faith MOT. Is your faith where you want it to be? How might you grow it or deepen it, fashion it into something which will endure? Okay, so let's put some flesh onto the context of James here. There are several Jameses in the New Testament, but scholars reckon that this book was written by James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is mentioned in Matthew 13 and who led the church in Jerusalem. This is the same James who experienced a resurrection appearance of Jesus. We can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15. And once he'd seen the risen Christ, that was the thing that likely led to his conversion. We reckon that this letter was written to various churches, not one in particular. He begins boldly here from verse two. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. His first point is this, difficult times grow faith in us. James writes that trials produce perseverance. The Greek word here, hypomene, is better translated as patience. James is saying when you face trials in life, it is producing patience in you. He's not talking about passive waiting. He's not talking about the patience that you might need waiting in a dentist waiting room. This is about an active endurance that patience quality that will help you to finish a marathon or a lengthy project at work. The word hypomene, if you break it down even more, means to remain under. So imagine perhaps someone bent double with a heavy load, having to patiently carry something. But when James says, consider your trials as joy, what he is not saying is this. He's not saying your trials don't matter. He's not saying your trials aren't real. And he's not promising that your trials will necessarily end soon. Because when those that we know die tragically young or experience violation or injustice, or when we ourselves maybe face financial difficulty, relational struggle, ill health, shame, whatever it is that we're going through. When we see scenes of people fleeing their homes or suffering the horrors of famine. James is not saying this doesn't matter. James is not saying let's just skirt over it and paper over it with joy. No, what James is saying is this. There can be a joy in knowing that as we carry this heavy load of our own problems, but those of the world around us, it produces in us a patience to endure. He was writing to encourage a church experiencing persecution of the worst kind. This was a world where Christians were stoned and beaten and crucified. He's not negating their pain and he's not using platitudes and saying everything happens for a reason. He's being really clear. He's saying something will happen to your faith in this. When you persevere, endure and patiently await your reward in heaven, your faith will mature. As part of my role here at St Stephen's, I do a bit of work for the wider church, assessing candidates who sense a call to ordination. And early this week, I met a man who had fled to the UK, having been arrested for leading an underground church in Iran. Prior to this, he had experienced complete rejection from his family due to his conversion from Islam to Christianity. And after having arrived here, he spent three years languishing through the asylum system. He was extraordinarily lonely, he had no money, he was unable to speak English, and he was suffering from PTSD. When I met him this week to ask him why he wanted to be a priest, I was struck powerfully by two things. First, he had an astounding depth of faith and spiritual maturity. As James says, let perseverance in trials finish its work so that you may be mature in faith. That's what I saw in this man. But second, 
he had a joy and appreciation for what he had experienced, saying it had pushed him closer to Jesus than he ever thought possible. And as I wrote up my report about him, I thought to myself, yes, yes, this is the sort of man who needs to be ordained within the Church of England. There is so much that we can learn from him about a faith that endures. We patiently endure, James says, because of the reward we know that lies ahead. In our text today, in verse 12, it says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. This word crown, Stephanos, sometimes refers to a royal crown, but is more frequently used of that laurel wreath that's given to a a winning athlete in a race, a symbol of glory and honour. The crown is an emblem of spiritual success given by God to those who keep their faith in the midst of suffering and temptation. So the first point James wants to make is that difficult times grow faith in us. Second point, he says, doubt will come, but wisdom is there. Verse six says this, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. At first read, this is a bit tricky, isn't it? Is James saying that when I doubt, I'm useless, that I'm double-minded and unstable? Well, as ever, we weigh passages of the Bible in light of the rest of scripture. And there are doubters who God uses mightily throughout the Bible. Job, Moses, Peter, Thomas. What about the man in Mark 9 who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Was he double-minded? I don't think so. He believed, he just recognised that he had a way to go. And I feel like that all the time. At some point, all of us have intellectual doubts, and I'd suggest that God wants to engage in them with us, not to dismiss us. Jesus didn't shoo the doubters away. He talked to them and answered their questions. So within the context of this whole letter, James is speaking less about intellectual doubt, but more about split loyalties. His word, double-minded, which by the way is a word that he invented. I love that. If, If there isn't a word, just make it up. It translates best as two sold. James is saying, if you pray and put your faith in Christ on the one hand, but you also put your faith and trust in other things, so money, other gods or other people, to try to cover all your bases, this is double-minded. This is like you have two souls. He says we're not to do this, to be duly aligned. Do you know, if I had a fiver for everyone who said to me, Rachel, I wish I had your faith, I'd be rich. But my reply to each of those people is this, you can have my faith. Lift the faith you have from the things you put it in, your career, your bank balance, your relationship, and put it instead into Jesus. That's a choice we all have. Faith is not a random thing that some people have and others don't. We make a choice not to be double-minded, but to put our faith in Jesus. When you marry someone, you can't see into the future. Will this person be faithful to me? Will they live a long life? Will we have the relationship I hope and dream we will have? You weigh the evidence of the time spent with that person and you make a call. You put your faith in them. But you don't then cover your bases by also having another few relationships on the side as insurance policies in case this one goes wrong. James wants to say, if you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he rose from the dead, don't be double soul, double minded, but seek to wholeheartedly put your faith in Jesus. He also tells us where to go when we experience doubt. He says, if you lack wisdom, ask God who will give generously. Who does that? Where do you look for wisdom? The text here doesn't say, if you lack wisdom, read a book or ask your mates or Google it. Do you know, recently something happened to a friend of mine and she asked for my advice and I did three things. I Googled her problem, I asked another friend, and then I asked my mum. And then a few days later, when I still had no clue how to advise my friend, I prayed. But what if I had prayed first. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, go to God. Maybe if I'd have done that first, he'd have shown me what to say to my friend. 
James wants to say doubt will come, but wisdom is there. Finally then, how do we grow a faith that endures? I'm speaking here particularly to those of you who, in answering my first question at the start of this talk, feel perhaps that your faith is wavering. Let me finish with this illustration. Last week, my family and I were on holiday and we were staying in a cottage that had a log burner. And one evening, my husband decided to light a fire. And at first, the fire was roaring and it was really healthy and warm and really heated the whole room. But then as a family, we went into a different room to the kitchen to prepare food. And we were away maybe half an hour. When we came back into the lounge, the fire had nearly gone out. We thought, quick, let's rescue the fire. It turns out that it was desperate for oxygen. We needed to open these little vents in the side of the log burner and to fan the fire into flame. Your faith needs oxygen. It needs feeding if it is to burn brightly. Every day that you don't fan your faith into flame, it will be getting weaker. Every day your faith isn't growing, it is contracting. Being a Jesus follower in 2022 in the UK is not mainstream. There are a gazillion distractions and people and places and things that are courting for your faith. To keep your faith in Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus, you have to feed it and fan it and to give it that metaphorical spiritual oxygen that it needs. And this is what produces faith that endures. When I was speaking to that Iranian candidate earlier this week, I asked him, how do you feed your faith? And he said this, I read my Bible every morning and every evening. I say the Lord's Prayer at various points through the day. I pray in tongues at various points through the day. I'm part of two congregations, an English speaking one and a Farsi speaking one. I'm in a small group that meets for deeper fellowship and I serve on a team that works with refugees. This guy has experienced awful trials and his answers build up over time with this. He said, I haven't always had a strong faith, but these things help me to fuel my faith, to strengthen my faith. To summarize, he was saying, pray, read your Bible, be in a small group, serve on a team. None of this is new, but if you want a faith that endures, my advice would be this. If you're doing none of those things, do one. If you're doing two of those things, do three. If you're doing them sporadically, do them more often. There is no life hack, no shortcut to cultivating a faith that endures. But let's pray as James does. Let perseverance finish its work so that we may be mature and complete. Amen. Rachel, thank you so much for that inspiring preach. Let's spend some time in prayer now. Lord, we give you thanks that we can have faith in you, whether we're coming today with a lot of faith or not much faith, or whether our faith is feeling a bit battered, or whether we're searching for faith. Thank you that you are drawing us to yourself, Lord, and that James encourages that there are always things we can do to cultivate and grow our faith. So Lord, wherever we are today, we pray that you'll fan into flame faith within us. Would you feed our faith in order that it might grow? In Jesus' name, Amen. We're now going to sing our final song of worship, How Great Thou Art. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior.
What an incredible hymn. Thank you so much for joining us this week for Online Church. As we continue into our weeks, a few words from the book of Romans. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless you and have a wonderful week. 